Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Lynn O'Hara, and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. We're very excited to join in our second of our webinar series with our partners at the National Archives and the White House Historical Association. Our goal tonight is to help show you some strategies for research. We know that many of you have chosen topics for your National History Day project and are now trying to figure out how to get to good resources. When we did a webinar last year, we had a lot of requests for ways to search out primary sources because they're so important to your project. And so that's what we're going to focus on for the next hour or so. As we get started, what we'd like to let you know is that if you're working on a desktop or a laptop, you can input your questions in the question box. If you're working on a tablet or an iPad, you won't have this feature. But anyone has the option to tweet questions to us at National History Day, please use the hashtag TeachNHD. Our goal this evening is to answer as many of your questions as possible. Some of them will answer you directly. And for others, what we'll do is we'll save them for the end if they're big picture questions that we think more lots of people can benefit from. To get started, I'd just like to remind everyone that we have a revised contest rulebook for the 2015 National History Day contest. This is in effect in the spring of 15 for school contests, regional contests, and our affiliate contests as well as the national contest. What I'd like to let everybody know, when you go to the NHD webpage, this rule book can be downloaded for free and printed. And I encourage all students who are getting started on NHD to make sure you have a copy in your NHD folder or binder. It will be really, really helpful. What I'd like to do to get things started is to turn things over to the White House Historical Association. They're going to give you some tips and tricks in order to get your hands on primary sources. So I'm going to turn things over to William Bouchon. Thank you for joining us, joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I look forward to uh, talking with all the students that are out there in the Ethernet world. Um, good evening. Uh, most of you who are uh, working on uh, your projects will uh, have already, I assume, uh, finished preliminary research and begun to develop what uh, would be a thesis statement or some kernel of uh, putting together what uh, your uh, plan is for your research project. That's a very useful tool to get started with, and uh, it's something that you can share with uh, librarians and archivists as you go through and start trying to find uh, primary sources in uh, the various repositories you're going to be working in. It really is a huge help, and those folks are the ones who are going to be uh, vital to your research, and every historian at every level uh, relies heavily on archivists and librarians and colleagues in order to get good information and tips and, and ways to find uh, historic resources. So I'm just going to go walk you through uh, a, a quick uh, sort of uh, uh, case study, so to speak, in, in a way. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the, uh, <clears throat> a book by Michael Bromley, Will, William Howard Taft, and the First Motoring Presidents. And um, at, at the, here at the White House Historical Association, we were interested in finding out much more about William, Taft, William Howard Taft and the uh, first automobile for uh, a, uh, a White House Christmas ornament that we produced uh, a year or two ago. And, and uh, so anyway, one of the first things we wanted to know was is, uh, uh, who was uh, working at the White House at that time, and uh, what were their roles, and how did uh, you know, President Taft come to find his uh, and buy an automobile, as he was the first automobile president? As you can see in the footnote, you see the page on the right there, the the the, uh, the whole book, that you, you know, the the open pages, and then on footnote 44, you see that uh, the uh, the author mentions the White House chauffeur George Robinson. And uh, he talks about his uh, interview with uh, a historian, Herbert Ridgway Collins, who wrote a book many years ago for the Smithsonian called Presidents on Wheels. So the, that interview no longer exists. But we were interested in trying to find out more about George Robinson and about his role at the White House. And here you see the first thing we did was sort of like, uh, OK, well, let's find out if there's anything out there in the uh, newspaper world. And uh, we were able to go to uh, a digital archive of newspapers, and uh, luckily enough, someone had written an article about George Robinson, called him a regular daredevil, uh, and uh, who was uh, Taft's driver. And we found out from that article that Taft loved to 
uh, ride in the, uh, his uh, white steamer that you see on the right, the photograph uh, that we found at the Library of Congress in the Princeton Photographs Division. And lo and behold, there was George Robinson actually at the wheel. Uh, so that was uh, really a great find uh, to, uh, to put those things together and, uh, of course, uh, uh, tie all that in with uh, President Taft's love of motoring and uh, feeling the, the wind blowing through his hair as his driver, George Robinson, was uh, speeding down the highway. Uh, but we know, wanted to know a little more, so we kept digging. We went into the National Archives uh, collection, uh, which is uh, Record Group 42. And uh, the record group uh, 42 is a um, collection of papers that are related to the uh, maintenance of the White House uh, that went that during that time in uh, 19 uh, in the early 20th century until 1933 it was under the jurisdiction of the uh, Office of Public Buildings and Grounds, which was uh, within uh, the purview of the Army Corps of Engineers. What was interesting as we started going through and looking at the period for William Howard Taft was we came across this, uh, uh, this blueprint of, uh, that, uh, that uh, broke out the, um, uh, the president's staff and how it was organized in that time. So what's very interesting about this is it, it does show a break between the clerk's side of the, uh, of the world of the White House and then the uh, domestic or the uh, uh, residential side of the house, you can see is on the Mrs. Taft. And um, so that was uh, the first indication we'd seen where that was actually broken uh, into two pieces. And before that, uh, the White House was managed uh, with uh, really a, one umbrella under the display. Okay, thank you. seems like we're having just a slight audio issue from our friends at the White House Historical a box, uh, a uh, section called Garage and Stable. So we were able from that to find out that uh, Robinson made $100 a month. And uh, so that gave us uh, some uh, interesting uh, insights into uh, where this, the chauffeur sort of uh, belonged within the uh, overall uh, structure of the White House staff. And you can see that uh, folks who actually worked in the, in the residence were uh, made, paid much less than the, than the uh, chauffeurs. And uh, so that was really interesting because it showed us that the chauffeur really was more than just a driver. He was also, as we found out, uh, also a mechanic. So that was part of the, the job as well. So if you compare that, of course, with others uh, on the other side, you see that uh, the annual salaries. And the other interesting thing is that you also see how the president paid his staff is through a number of different sources. There was no one comprehensive source. So there's a lot of information here on this sheet. Uh, about the White House, about the way things were broken out, and that uh, also gave us some great information about the grounds. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is uh, how we go about doing things in terms of dissecting and moving through uh, from footnotes to uh, primary sources and, and gaining new insights that way. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and getting things started. Many of our students are going to be going through this process where they start with secondary research and are trying to get themselves into primary research. And what I'd like to do is turn things over to Stacy Chandler. Uh, she's a textual archivist at the John F. Kennedy Library to talk about different types of primary sources you might uncover during your research. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Uh, so, like Lynn mentioned, um, I'm Stacy Chandler. I'm an archivist at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library in Boston. We're part of the National Archives, so most of the examples I'm using today are going to come from my library, but they will still apply to wherever you're doing your research. So, first of all, um, archivists are a little different from historians and teachers, even from librarians. We work directly with primary sources, so we can tell you what we have in our archives that can help you and let you know about other archives we think might be useful. So here are some of the things that we can do for you. We can give you suggestions about secondary sources on your topic, give you facts like dates and locations. We can also copy or scan documents and tell you how to cite them. There are some things we can't do because we're archivists and not historians. We can't pick specific documents for you to study, and we can't do any analysis or interpretation on them. We also can't proofread your project or give our opinions about historical events or people. 
but we do want to make sure we always say, when in doubt, just ask. We are here to help you find what you need for your research. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about different kinds of paper, or we call textual resources, to help you with your research. And the main way historians research any topic is by using primary sources. So primary source documents are really the raw materials of history. They can be papers that were created during the time you're studying, but they can also be documents that were created later by people who were directly involved in what you're studying. And those would be things like oral history interviews and memoirs. And primary source documents can be a lot of different things, but they have a few things in common. They're going to give you an inside view of what you're studying, and they're original and unchanged, which means they haven't been interpreted, summed up, or explained for you already. And they'll also give you what archivists call unique information, and that's just information that you can't find anywhere else. The secondary sources, on the other hand, which you guys probably know, they explain the primary sources so you can understand what happened as a whole. And whether a specific document counts as a primary or secondary source really depends on your research topic. So I'm going to go over some different types of documents and tell you about ways that my researchers would use them as primary sources. So first off, correspondence. When people think about primary sources, I think correspondence is one of the first things that come to mind. Uh, and correspondence is really just writing from one person directly to another person. And this includes things like personal letters, like what you'd get in the mail, official letters, which are usually called memos, and they go from one office to another office, and telegrams, which used to be a to get a message to somebody, sort of like a slower version of a text message. There's one up here on the screen. This is a telegram from Martin Luther King Jr. to JFK. It's about JFK's famous civil rights speech in 1963. And if a researcher came to me looking for primary sources to understand what civil rights leaders thought about this speech, this would be a really good resource to study. So it's an original document. It was created during the time of study by a civil rights leader whose point of view the researcher is studying too. And you can see the full message. It's not just quotes or a shortened version. And you get unique information out of it, of course, which is the inside look at the relationship between Martin Luther King and President Kennedy. And then after reading through this document, it's then up to the researcher to read secondary sources about JFK and the Civil Rights Movement, and then explain in their own project why this telegram is important. So like correspondence, scrapbooks and diaries are some of my favorite primary sources in archives. They can give you an inside view of a life or event, and they are great finds for historians because they tend to be very personal. They can include a really wide range of materials, like letters, drawings, photos, sometimes lots of hair, objects, things like that. After you read through someone's scrapbook or journal, you can end up feeling like you were there, watching an event from their point of view, which makes them really great primary resources. This is an example of a scrapbook that researchers have used to learn about the early life of the writer Ernest Hemingway. His papers are in the National Archives. And his mother put uh, childhood artwork and writing in this scrapbook. And I would suggest that researchers look at this source when they're interested in studying how his writing developed over the years. And this is a big one that I think a lot of students are going to end up using, which is the media. Of course, for most of history, there's no CNN or NBC, there's no internet either. So for a long time, print media was really the best way for regular people to hear about what was going on in the world and also to express their own opinions about it through things like editorials and surveys. And that makes historical newspapers and magazines, even radio and TV, from the time you're working on, really good primary sources if you're explaining what the press or the public was saying about something. So for this document you see on the screen, this newspaper clipping announced that JFK was running for president. It also talks about whether voters would care that he was Catholic. And there's a whole folder of articles just like this in JFK's presidential campaign papers here at the library. So for researchers writing about how the media had covered JFK's campaign, this article and all the other stuff in that same folder would be really useful sources to quote from. Of course, sometimes media works a little better as a secondary source. So if you're studying, for example, uh, how the Vietnam War started, a magazine article about the war would be a good secondary source because the person writing the article didn't have direct sort of inside knowledge about the way the war started. They only wrote about it from a distance. But if you're studying how the press covered the Vietnam War, 
that same article would make a great primary source because you would need to explain and interpret the war coverage yourself. Uh, another type of primary document uh, that can be really useful is actually a transcript. A transcript is usually a typed or written version of something that was originally said out loud. And some historians work on time periods or topics that don't have any recordings, like during Abraham Lincoln's time or even on certain modern legal trials that don't allow recordings. And they have to rely entirely on transcripts and other written records to know what was said. Now that we can easily record sounds and images, people can use those recordings as primary sources. Archivists and historians usually think it's best to actually to listen to or to watch the original version of anything, if there is one, because the speaker's tone of voice and their pauses, even their gestures, can sometimes say just as much as the words themselves say. But an exact word-for-word -word transcript or copy of what was said does count as a primary source. Newspapers, books, and websites sometimes print the text of speeches, phone calls, even original documents. We call those reprinted. And as long as you can read the full statement or document from start to finish, those are primary sources too. So you can see three text versions of the same speech right here. It's a transcript of the speech that was created by the White House that JFK gave. The full speech is reprinted in the book, Public Papers of John F. Kennedy. And finally, the full speech is typed out on a website there, American Presidency Project, which is actually one of my favorites for searching for JFK quotes. And all of these count as primary sources, just as long as they match up exactly to what was really said. And lastly, sometimes, even after you do really good primary and secondary source research, being creative about where to find information is the only way to fill in gaps in the historical record. And unusual types of primary sources are a great way to do that. So in addition to looking at traditional sources like letters, diaries and newspapers, as well as the printed materials like memoirs and reprints from books, the unexpected documents in archives can be a great way to add to the story you're telling. So these are some good examples of primary source documents some of my researchers have used at the library to find more information about a historical person or place or event. For example, the one on the bottom there. Where would you look if you were trying to figure out where Hemingway was on a certain day in the 1920s? You might try to look at the dates and locations of some of the envelopes he sent, or even the stamps in his passport. But when the date you need isn't there, what about Hemingway's collection of tickets to bullfighting matches that he went to? Seems like kind of a weird place to look for information, but if you look closely at the bottom document, one of his ticket stubs, you'll see that they're dated, telling you which event he attended, where, and when. And the yellow paper there on the right shows you some of JFK's doodles from his meetings during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's when he was trying to figure out how to avoid starting a nuclear war. And it might look like just a scrap of paper, but uh, it's an inside view, really, into what JFK was thinking. You can see a nuclear bomb going off in the middle of the page. But what's really interesting to researchers is the word that he wrote over and over again on this piece of paper, which is decision which you see all over the page with little boxes drawn around it. And historians quote this document a lot to explain the real pressure of the situation JFK was in and the importance of the decisions he had to make and his own recognition of the importance of those decisions. So if you think a little outside of the traditional resources, that's something that good historians always try to do. And archivists can always help you to try to think of great primary and secondary sources to help you based on your topic. And you should keep in mind, too, that the National Archives and a lot of the presidential libraries, including mine, we've scanned and put online millions of primary source documents, including everything that I just showed you in this presentation. And that's just to help our researchers find what you need for your project. So don't ever hesitate to get in touch with us. That's why we're here. And um, I think that's all I have. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Stacy. One of the things that we found is that archivists at the National Archives and the White House Historical Association and the education specialists there love to hear from people. They have great collections, but it's really important that other people get to see it. So one of the things that we're going to do now is turn things over to Elizabeth Dinchel. Elizabeth works at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. She's an education specialist out in Iowa. And she's going to talk about other types of sources that you might encounter. I'm going to turn things over. Thanks, Elizabeth.
Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Dinchel. Like she said, um, I'm in Iowa. I do work for the National Archives, but I'm at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, much like Stacy's at the JFK. And I'm going to talk about oral histories, photographs, and sound and film. Um, I know oral histories have become a, a hot topic over the last couple of years, and so we're going to talk a little bit about those. The first thing I want to talk about is what oral history is not. Um, the first thing I want to say is that emails, even when they're correspondence between two people, are not oral histories. Uh, something else that we won't identify as oral histories is journalism interviews, especially when they're done for major networks. Um, even though they kind of appear to be oral histories on the surface, there are some differences between the them in oral histories that I will talk about. Speeches, even though they're delivered verbally, are not oral histories either. Quotes that occur in secondary or primary sources are also not oral histories. Another thing that comes up as often as oral histories are random recordings. And random recordings, even if they're recording conversations between people, are not oral histories. So what are oral histories? What I've put up for you guys is a definition that's set forth by the Oral History Association. And the Oral History Association is kind of our guiding body of scholars that helps us understand what oral history is. And this was actually written by a man named Donald Ritchie, who actually wrote the book on what oral history is. But I want to point out some of the things that uh, he says in here. Uh, it collects memories and personal commentaries of historical significance through recorded interviews. An oral history generally consists of a well-prepared interviewer questioning an interviewee and recording their exchange in audio or video format. Um, the other thing I really want to point out um, is that there's a back and forth dialogue that occurs between the person being interviewed and the person that is doing the interviewing. Which leads me to how we're going to source these oral histories. And I want to point out at the bottom in the vocabulary, because when you read about oral histories, they'll talk often about the interviewee or the narrator. And those words are interchangeable, and what that is, is it's the person being interviewed or the subject of the oral history interview. And so when you see transcripts from oral histories, sometimes it will have the person's name, or sometimes it will say narrator or interviewee. So I just want you to be aware of that if you look at transcriptions. So I want to point out where we're going to source an oral history as a primary source or a secondary source. When it's a primary source, the narrator was present at the historic time and was a witness or a participant. The interview is with the person. It is not about the person. If it's a secondary source, the narrator may be an expert about the event. Um, a professor is a good example. Or they may be a family member. And in that case, they're talking about a person's experience. Uh, the White House Historical Association, uh, Association has great interviews with the de Priest family um, descendants about their family's involvement with the desegregation of the White House. And that's a great example of a secondary oral history source. So I'm going to kind of point you guys to where you can find oral histories. And we're going to use a vocabulary word here again, and it's repository. And you'll hear archivists and historians talk about repositories all the time. The repository is where the records are stored. So the National Archives is a repository, for example. The oral history has a compiled list of oral history um, repositories. You can visit their website and explore some of the places that oral histories are available. There are some other great places you can look. You can look at universities. You can look at your local libraries, your local historical societies. Um, you would be astonished to find that oral histories are available everywhere. 
I also would encourage you as students to do your own oral histories. Students have produced amazing oral histories all over the country. And I want to show you two examples of oral history programs that were led by students. Um, telling their stories with the Urban School of San, Fran San Francisco and Macomb High School uh, did wonderful interviews all over the country interviewing um, pe different people that were involved in the Holocaust, uh, people that were involved in the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and then Macomb High School has their own program called Macomb Legacies. And Macomb High School went on to produce some very amazing NHD documentaries with their oral histories. I'm going to turn to talking about photographs now. One of the big things I want everybody to keep in mind when they use photographs is that they should have a proper citation. Right-clicking a photograph off of a Google search will not be enough for you to be able to use it as the primary source. We don't know where that photograph came from. We don't know who took it. Um, it could be appearing on a blog. Uh, it could be really anywhere. So what I gave you guys was a link here, and let's see if we can get that to load up, to what a proper citation looks like. And this is from the National Archives. But you can see what collection it came from, what series it came from, uh, the photograph itself. And what we're looking for is this provenance that's going to tell us when the photographs, photograph was taken, who took it, what repository holds it. Um, the other thing we're going to look for is context. We want to know who or what is in the picture, when was it taken, who took it. And these are going to be our clues to determine whether or not the photograph will be used as a primary or secondary source. This photograph was taken by Dorothea Lange. It's a very famous photograph. It's titled Migrant Mother. So we know that the lady that appears in the picture with her children was a destitute pea farmer during the Great Depression. Again, we know when it was taken. It was taken uh, during the Great Depression and we took it. Now, if my project is going to focus on the works of Dorothea Lang, this is a great primary source to uh, show Dorothea's work. If I want to show uh, what living conditions were like during the Great Depression, this again would be a great primary source for that. But if I want to look at something different, say photo composition, or maybe I'm looking at something more abstract, this isn't going to be a primary source for that. I want to talk about sound and film a little bit. Um, this photograph is also of Dorothea Lang, um, a famous photograph of her standing on a car with her camera to take pictures. Sound and film, the same rules apply. We need to have a good citation for sound and for film. Uh, if you don't have a good citation, again, we don't know where it came from. We don't know how it was used. We lose that big part of context. We need to know who or what is in that film or sound clip, when was it recorded, who recorded it. And we need to talk about how we're going to use it. Um, I'm going to use it, the example of the movie 300 because 300 talks about a, a time in history that's recorded in the histories. But if we're going to try to use the movie as a primary source, it's not a reflection of the historic record. These are actors, they're reenacting a historic time period. That makes it not a primary source. However, if we're talking about the director or the producer and we're showing the works of that artist, then we can use it as a primary source. And the place to explain that would be in our annotated bibli bibliography to talk about how we incorporated it into the project that we did. And I am going to give it back to Lynn.
your plan. We can hear you, Missy. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, so I'm Missy McNatt. I'm an education specialist at the National Archives, and I'm also the DC coordinator for the National History Day program. And I'm going to talk a little bit about evaluating, in a very, very broad way, the Internet. So when you're starting the research process, I'm, you're aware that there's so much information out there. and available to us in so many ways and, and many many students begin the research process um, on the internet you have to keep in mind the internet um, includes anything that's published online so in fact there are some amazing sources primary sources you've heard them alluded to from the National Archives, from the White House Historical Association, that you can access newspapers. I saw a ProQuest up there. So there are many, many amazing resources you can access um, online. Um, but there's also lots of other junk on there as well. And you always need to remember that websites are not regulated for quality or accuracy, and anyone can create a website. So I came up with a very, very basic method of evaluating websites using the five W's. Uh, your media specialist may have an evaluation sheet of some sort. You may have some of your own, your, your teachers. You know, whatever you have, the most important thing is to always think um, and ask questions about the website. So I'm going to just go through this uh, relatively quickly and uh, spend a little bit more time looking at some um, websites. So who? Who is very important? Who wrote the pages? Can you find that contact information for the person? Can you find any biographical information? If you can't find an author, can you find who created the website? And then also think about the intended audience. What's the purpose of the website? Is it trying to sell you something? Is it trying to persuade you? What kinds of information? And then that essential question, is it reliable and credible? And actually getting at that information by asking these questions. The bias, um, you know, the spelling and grammatical errors can tell you a lot about the website. And again, you know, what, what's the purpose? What's the intent? Um, when was the website uh, uh, created? Is it current? Is, it, is there a date for it? When was it revised? And very important to check out those links. Um, are they current and um, active? Again, this sort of circles around a little bit. Where does the information come from? Circles back to who? Um, finding that sponsor and then finding those citations for information on the website. And then why? Why is it created? Sometimes you can find that information by looking at the domain extension, those last letters of the web address. And um, EDU websites, um, education websites can be great places. I know the University of Virginia has an amazing website. George Mason does. Um, .gov websites. The archives is a .gov website. Um, .org websites are, can be amazing resources. They are unrestricted. .net, they are usually for the internet service providers, um, so perhaps not so great. .com, obviously commercial, unrestricted. And then there's some other types. Um, we get down to those libraries. They may not have the sources right there, but they may have a card catalog that's worth checking out. And then, of course, anyone personal um, can have websites. So I'm just going to go through the research process you know, very quickly and just pulling up some pages. Um, we all know the National History Day theme this year is leadership and legacy in history. I'm interested in environmental um, issues. I'd like to research a woman. And Rachel Carson fits the above criteria. So I'm going to start that research um, on the internet. And I go to Google. I Google Rachel Carson. And this is what shows up. And interestingly enough, you can see the first site that comes up is Rachel Carson Middle School in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, so that's probably not going to be very helpful. No surprise, the next website that shows up is Wikipedia. 
um, the free encyclopedia. And then we go on from there, the life and legacy of Rachel Carson and some other ones. So we're going to hit jump into um, Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia, I think most of us are aware, is a tertiary source. So the information is taken from secondary sources. The other thing that makes Wikipedia very interesting um, is that anyone can contribute to it. Um, I, am, I often think about this story um, from a number of years ago when I taught. This has been quite a few years ago, and I had my students there working on National History Day projects, and we were in the computer lab, and this student came running up to me, Mrs. McNatt, Mrs. McNatt, I need to show you something. So I went over there, and he had gotten onto Wikipedia. He had made some rather egregious changes to an article, and he had gotten it published. Um, but I will say that Wikipedia does have oversight, and they very quickly changed it, and they told him in an email that if he ever did that again, he would not be allowed access. So there is oversight, and that's good. Um, to, to keep in mind. And it's also a place where we can start to get some very basic information and maybe read a little bit and decide if this is something you know, that we're interested in pursuing. So it is an encyclopedia type article that anyone can contribute to. Um, so as we look down the page, we can find some useful information. So there's a list of works by Rachel Carson. Um, so might be worth checking those out. Printing, the, printing it out and seeing um, if we can access those at the library. We do see a page of citations, and if you look at those, you'll notice that the same um, author is used over and over again. So we know that most of the information about Rachel Carson in this article is pulled from just um, a relatively few sources. Um, it also, and that's confirmed when we look at the uh, work cited in the article, there are not very many um, authors listed, but they are listed. And then we have some further reading. So again, I think Wikipedia is useful for a couple of things, giving you some very basic background information, and then really looking at the, um, the work cited uh, information. But you'll notice there's no author. There's no information about who actually wrote this and who you know, pulled this information together. So Wikipedia serves a purpose. Um, I would not recommend including it in your bibliography. Um, if you're in your process paper, you might talk about the fact that um, when you started the research process, you went to the internet, you, know, you Googled it, you did look at a Wikipedia article. I think that's, that's fine. So this is the second um, set site that came up, um, rachelcarson.org, and um, we find out that uh, there is a biography. You can see it over on the left-hand side. Um, so there's a great deal of information about the creator of the website. Um, so that's helpful, and find out she wrote a book. And again, you know, my um, uh, what I would probably do is try to find that book and, and read it and not just use the website. Um, also on the, this website that helps to make it a little more credible, the copyright information for the photographs and the text, uh, even for the illustration. So those, those are all positive things about this website. Again, you know, as far as the information itself goes, remember um, it's, you know, she's drawing it from her book. She did write the book, so that's all good. But the thing that I would strongly recommend is getting hold of that book and reading it. And then um, the research guide. And here we find a list of where um, the collections of, of, of Rachel Carson's papers are. So this, I think, can be one of the most helpful things um, from this particular website. So, it, you know, there is lots of great things. Um, just to check out some other types of websites on Rachel Carson. This is a .edu, and it turns out it's talking about the Rachel Carson Institute that's at Chatham University. So probably not much on Rachel Carson. However, I might sort of store it in the back of my head of, hmm, maybe this is a legacy, the fact that there's an institute named after her. Just sort of thinking about that. 
And then um, a .gov website about Rachel Carson. And so, in fact, there's a wildlife refuge in Maine na uh, named for Rachel Carson. So again, kind of storing in the back of my head of, gee, here's, here's a legacy um, that uh, she was so well known that she's, you know, been uh, a wildlife refuge has been named for her as well as an institute. Then we have a .com website with a very interesting title, Rachel Carson Didn't Kill Millions of Africans. And already by reading the title of this, I'm thinking that it's not something I want to pursue. Um, waste my time on reading it. And you can also see there are all kinds of ads there as well. So you know, be discerning as you go through. Um, I'd say if I were to research Rachel Carson, what I would do now is I would go to my local library. I'd find those books written by Rachel Carson. Um, I would check the library catalog for books about Rachel Carson, including the ones that we noticed on the website. Um, I would also look for books about other issues around Rachel Carson, environmental movement. And then um, in reading through the information, I you know, find that Rachel Carson um, did work for the federal government for quite a few years. You already heard how helpful folks at the National Archives are contacting someone to probably to possibly help you. Um, also, uh, her papers went to the Beneke Library at Yale University. So possibly contacting someone there. You just, um, I find that folks are always very willing to um, help um, National History Day students. So and contacting other universities. So just. Um, well, a few suggestions about evaluating the internet. Back to you, Lynn. Thank you, Missy. I appreciate your help here. One of the things I want to students to keep in mind is that while these places may not be in your backyard, everybody has history in their backyard. And I think some of the best National History Day projects come from local projects. What I would like to do now is turn things back over to the White House Historical Association. When we talk about history, sometimes we need to talk about historic places and historic sites. So Courtney Speckman, who's the Director of Education there, is going to talk about one example of a historic site and might give you some ideas when you get to see historic sites in your area. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Lynn. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to be focusing on is how you can use a historic site as a primary source and different resources that you can use to source that in, in your bibliographies. So what information we can learn from historic sites and buildings as well as where we can find more information um, maybe to, to use as we are sourcing these as um, primary, primary sources. So thinking about the White House, how, how the White House can be used as a primary source, obviously there are a lot of events and things that take place there, but looking at the architecture of the building, it also tells a lot of stories. And in general, buildings do provide information about the people who lived and or worked there, as well as the time period when it was built. So looking at the architecture, we have early plans of the White House that was designed by James Hoban, so you can learn a little bit more about why the White House looks the way it does. There's a lot of great information about that. Um, and on the right, you can see some evidence of the burn marks that are um, remaining from when the British burned the White House during the War of 1812, 200 years ago. So there's a lot of physical evidence and physical scars that will tell you stories about things that happened in the history of the house, as well as um, about the people who, who were there. Um, and I have an example from the White House that shows the building of the West Wing. This, the West Wing is when the executive offices originally were in the second floor of the White House, on the same floor where the, the President's family was living um, for many years. On the left-hand side, you see a handwritten drawing made by Edith Roosevelt, the wife of President Theodore Roosevelt, um, that assigned rooms for the six children that were living in the White House with them. And of course, it was this overcrowding in the same, same floor where the president's offices were that led Theodore Roosevelt to request a temporary executive office building um, to the west of the White House. And as you see in the floor plan, and it was originally meant to be a temporary office building. You can see um, some of the things that do tell us about the time and the experiences of, of the people that were there. You have um, the president's room. We don't have an Oval Office yet. That wasn't 
established until the Taft administration, but there are things like the telegraph room and the press room, and those, you know, the press room is, is still in the White House, but not in that location. Do we really need a telegraph room today? What, would, what was that experience like for the people who were living and working at the White House? Um, as we know, the, the executive offices, the West Wing, was not temporary. In fact, it expanded and was enlarged many times. Um, but these kind of documents do tell the story and will tell you why it was important for that wing to be built in the first place. Um, to turn things over a little bit, we have a, a case study at Decatur House. Um, it's one of the only remaining slave quarters that you're seeing um, that we know of in Washington, D.C., certainly within sight of the White House. And in 2010, the White House Historical Association established the David and Rubenstein National Center for White House History at Decatur House. It's a National Trust site, um, but we are charged with um, educating the public about this space and making connections to the history of the White House. And one of the first things that we did as, um, as we took a co-stewardship agreement with, with the Decatur House is to really study the slave quarters structure. Um, for many years, the slave quarters was used by um, the servants to the family. There, were, there was a family living in the slave quarters until the early 1960s. And then when the National Trust became the owners of the property, they turned this, the structure into their office space before it, it turned into a gallery. So when the White House Historical Association started managing this property in 2010, we really peeled back the layers of the slave quarters to study the architecture and to try to see what kind of clues we could get about the men and women who lived there. So here you see the interior views. On the top left you see um, some of the, the architectural study. We had a lot of architectural historians here and working with us for a long time. You can see we, we studied the dendrochronology, which means the study of wood, to determine how old the building was. And one of the, the big discoveries that was made is that this building, instead of dating to the 1830s, which was what was originally thought because of the owner who lived here at the time, this building actually dates about 15 years earlier than what, what was thought from doing analysis on the wood and um, the other historic fabric that remains. We also have a lot of ghost marks that remain. It's an architectural term that shows us where, um, where historic fabric used to be. So on the bottom two corner, or the bottom two photographs, we see um, the ghost marks from the walls that, that were in place. So the door frames in the top right hand side show um, the separation of the spaces that are now open, but we have been able to do a lot of research in this building to learn more about the experience for the men and women who would have lived here, as well as um, spent time here. And on the next page we have a floor plan. This is from the Historic American Building Survey, or HABS, and I'll be referring to it as HABS um, for, the rest of, for the rest of our time tonight. Um, this shows what that Second floor, um, second floor of the slave quarters looked like in 1937. This is when an Italian family who was serving the last owner of Decatur House were living. They were living on the first and second floors. And here they've added a few modern things like a toilet, which would not have been there when it was, well, it would not have been there when it was originally built. Um, they have their office, they have bedrooms, storage, kitchen, and a laundry room, among other things. But using, um, using drawings and floor plans will help us see how these spaces were used a long time ago and, and can be sourced. And I'll go to our next slide. Um, HABS, it began in 1933 to document America's architectural heritage. Um, between the American Institute of Architects, the National Park Service, and the Library of Congress, they have a tripartite agreement um, to study the history of architecture and document that for all of us. So the HABS collections, they're among the, the largest and most heavily used in the prints and photographs division of the Library of Congress, and it includes digitized images of measured drawings, black and white photographs, color transparencies, photo captions, data pages, including written histories and other supplemental data. And as Elizabeth was saying before, when 
you're talking about citing photographs for buildings, you also need the proper citation and context to cite historic, historic buildings. So here at the um, tabs documentation at the Library of Congress, you do see who created these images. We have a lot of other images, um, and these are some examples of the drawings and photographs that you would see about Decatur House on the Library of Congress site. So this is a great, great resource. There's also a lot of really good documents and drawings about the White House if you're interested in the White House as well. Um, another good resource to find um, primary sources that relate to historic sites is the National Park Service's uh, National Register of Historic Places. This is the official list of the nation's historic places that are worthy of preservation. And in order to become um, in order to become a part of the National Register, you do need to be nominated. So there's a nomination form, and this page that you see here is the document that was created as part of the nomination form to become part of the National Register. And this um, PDF site will take you to the Decatur House um, nomination form, so you can see that in its entirety. It does include a lot of other descriptions and information about the history of the building as in, an, in addition to architectural history and architectural resources. So I would encourage you to look at that as well. And um, the National Park Service does have a, a really great, re, or it has a great website um, about teaching with historic places. So here there are a lot of lesson plans, a lot of information and resources about how to learn from historic places, and um, I encourage you you to, to go here if you're interested in a specific site or a place and um, you can see what is on the National Register of Historic Places and, and learn from there. So I'll turn things back over to Lynn. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, there's a lot of good ideas in this webinar. Realize not everyone works for every single person. We realize that. But one of the things that we know that every student has to deal with is an annotated bibliography. So what I'm going to do is turn things over to Amy Page. Uh, Amy is a Bering Teacher Ambassador from New Mexico. Hi, can I, I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Um, I am a teacher from New Mexico. I've been participating in National History Day for nine years now with students at the regional, state, and national level. And our concern with um, with bibliographies is that sometimes there's confusion with bibliographies. So we need to we have all these wonderful sources and all these great places that folks have explained to you that you can get information. Now the question is, what do you do with all of it, and how do you manage it as you manage the project? So really quickly, let me just define what an annotated bibliography is, particularly um, for teachers or students who are new to National History Day. So. An annotated bibliography is a regular bibliography or work cited, with the exception that every citation that's entered into the bibliography has some type of an explanation. Some of those explanations might be informative, um, some of them might be evaluative, but in a History Day project, it's really sort of a combination. You are explaining how the source assisted your research process, what the importance was, how it built on um, the topic for you. So let's say I um, cited a newspaper article from 1936 um, that specifically explained a situation that was happening in Germany with the buildup of the Nazi party. Perhaps I would go back and say this source, um, maybe I'm, I'm looking at, at uh, United States going into World War II, so I might say this newspaper article helped me understand what was happening in Europe before my topic started, and you might expand on that a little bit. So that's essentially what an annotated bibliography is. Um, can you go to the next slide, Lynn? Um, the other thing about annotated bibliographies is that they can, they can get really long, so we want to figure out how do we manage them in advance. And one of the mistakes kids make, I think, is not understanding the importance of the bibliography. So when you look at a National History Day project, try to look at it like a miniature master's thesis. And what I mean by that is that you, you select a very defined topic that you are going to do in-depth research on. That's the research process of it. 
then you're going to create a final project and it's going to culminate in the presentation of your project, whether it's a paper or a documentary or a website performance exhibit. The defense of the work is where the bibliography comes in. This is where you're justifying your research. And so um, there's three steps to this. You have your process paper, which is explaining your research process and why you picked what you picked and how it fits in. The second one is the defense to the judges where you talk to them about your project and they ask you questions. But the third one that's often overlooked is the bibliography. And the bibliography is incredibly important because this is justifying everything that you've done. So when you look at the bibliography, it's important to sort of have a plan before you start. And the biggest question that comes up before kids have even thought through the organizational system is, what do I use, MLA or do I go with um, Turabian? Um, Chicago is also kind of interchangeable with Turabian. They're not exactly identical, but, but very close. And I've heard a great deal of debate over which one to go with. And, and here's the truth to it. Turabian is preferred by historians, but when it comes to a National History Day project, it doesn't matter which one you pick as long as you use it consistently. And as long as you um, are very um, adamant about making sure that you are using it correctly. And there's a number of different ways um, that kids get off track, but bibliographies can be a bit of a bear. And so coming up with a few of the things that you're going to establish at the beginning, if you start with MLA, make sure you use MLA all the way through. If you use MLA in your bibliography, please use MLA citation in your process paper as well. That's going to make it look more professional. And again, it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, some schools specifically teach a specific format. If your English department or your social studies department is using one or the other, then make that the one that you use for your project. I spend a lot of time kind of collaborating. I teach social studies. I collaborate with teachers in the English department with students for projects. And my English department prefers MLA in 10th and 11th grade. So we specifically use MLA in those grade levels. Um, so again, there isn't anything wrong um, with either one. Just be consistent. Next slide, if you don't mind, Lynn. So um, remember that the bibliography is legitimizing your research, and it's justifying your analysis. As a judge at Nationals, um, what I have learned is that judges don't have a great deal of time to go through some of these bibliographies. However, they are very, very careful about looking at the types of sources that are included, why they are included, and the scope of what was included. So um, I noticed um, one of the popular questions you know, relates to length of it, but really what are judges looking for? They're looking for the scope of, of the topic. Some topics will not have long bibliographies. I think that it's safe to say that most bibliographies at nationals average 10 to 15 pages. Um, 10 may be more common for junior division, 15 for senior division. And again, it's going to be determined by the topic and resource availability. Some local topics may have very few primary sources available. Um, the next big question that we'll often get is, how do we balance this ratio between primary and secondary sources? And again, this is going to depend on your topic. The more in-depth the research, the better. And the more in-depth the research, the longer the bibliography. What you don't want to do in a bibliography is put in sources that are not reliable. What you don't want to do is put in sources that are really there to fluff up the bibliography. That's not OK either. This is about justifying your research. Um, you want as many, obviously, as possible of primary sources, but secondary sources should not be overlooked. They're critical. They are going to help you develop your analysis. And when you create a History Day project, in the end, the judges are looking for why this topic mattered in history. What was its impact? What was the so what factor? And the secondary sources allow for that because they're written after the fact. We don't know the impact of our topic at the time that the primary sources are being created. We don't know them until the time that the secondary sources are being created. So those are critical. 
Um, and again, formatting with that bibliography should be consistent. And so don't switch back and forth between sources. Um, I think another pitfall with kids is that they um, tend to leave the bibliography until the end. And then they're sort of rushing it and they're missing critical things like spelling errors and that kind of stuff. So um, can you go to the next slide? Um, you want to make sure that you are dealing with um, the proofreading also. So the only other question that I get with MLA deals with spacing. MLA um, calls for double spacing. And when kids start to hit really long bibliography, something that's over 20 pages, it gets a little bit ridiculous to have it double spaced. And so there are some kids who will choose to single space or 1.5 space some of those bibliographies. And you can make a note of that in your process paper if you want to. Um, but that is, is one thing. So um, that said, a bibliography for History Day is not like the bibliographies that most kids between 6th and 12th grade do for their average classroom project. The average classroom assignment might require 3 to 10 sources. And we could be talking 20 pages of bibliography. And so kids don't really know when they're starting the process how to separate primary and secondary. And presentation tonight very clearly separated out how do you do that. The question then is, how do we put that into a bibliography? Um, one of the tools that kids are using are online bibliography generators. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight Noodle Tools here because it's a wonderful organizational system. They provided a free account to National History Day. And Lynn's got some stuff um, that she's going to be able to post. Teachers um, who are on the um, email um, send out also will get information on Noodle Tools. But what it does is it creates a system so that kids can organize stuff. And if you look, though, in this picture where we have um, similar related sources, you start to break down things like a reference source, a religious work, a report, a pamphlet or brochure, conference proceedings. Sometimes the kids don't know the difference between things. Sometimes understanding what the difference between a journal or a manuscript or an anthology are can make the difference between a correct annotation or citation and an incorrect citation. And so as a teacher um, and a coach of History Day, I think it's important that kids are able to understand the difference between a journal being um, you know, kind of a regular uh, publication and that it's, it's something that people send work into, um, similar to like a magazine. But what's the difference between a magazine and a journal? So that they know how to select the proper source um, category when they're citing. Uh, kids also, a basic thing is discussing with them how do we separate and alphabetize our sources. Noodle tools will do that for you. You have the option of separating primary and secondary. But when you create a bibliography, the first section should be all of your primary sources and they should be alphabetized. The second section should have all of your secondary sources and those should be alphabetized. And then many students, if they have tertiary, will include the tertiary um, sources in a third section and again alphabetize. So that's an important skill to teach also is how do you separate this stuff out. Um, and as teachers, especially um, with new students, we need to clarify what our annotation expectations are. It is not uncommon for a brand new student to use a citation generator and cite a website without citing, say, an article within it and give you a URL and an access date. And that's their entire citation. That is not an accurate citation. The kids need to learn how to search for the sources. Where do I find the author? Where do I find the publisher? What date was it published? How do I, how do I include an access date? So those are all skills that need to really be looked at carefully. And kids who are here online, some of them may be doing this on their own. Maybe you don't have a teacher who's coaching you effectively in History Day. I would suggest that you use either Noodle Tools or one of the others, whether it's EasyBib. You can set up a, um, a website for that. There's BibMe. There's, there's a number of them, um, Citation Machine. Make sure that you're understanding what each of those input boxes are and that you're finding the information and that you're accurately putting it in. And again, there are numerous online bibliography generators, and those can be great. But at the same time, 
sometimes when you just plug stuff into an online generator, um, you're missing the layout of the citation and what it means. And so when the citation then gets printed up, you might miss if you had had the wrong category. And so watch what you're doing with your citations. Look at how they're appearing when you're done. Um, next slide. OK, so what are some of the pitfalls? Um, annotations, again, are the explanation of that source. And so when you're creating a bibliography, you don't want, um, you don't want a citation or an annotation to lay over onto the next page. And sometimes that will leave some space at the bottom of a page. But you want the entire citation and annotation to appear on, a, on the same page. Um, one of the questions that kids have been throwing at us lately deals with URLs. And part of the reason for this is that judges at nationals, particularly in website and paper, because they have much more time to look at the bibliographies, um, some of the kids are getting comments in which the judges are requesting a URL. In the current MLA, URLs are not required. However, for National History Day, I suggest that the kids include a URL just so that they can avoid that. Um, I, I think that it's also um, a good habit for the kids because if you're including the URL and you need to go back to look at a source, you have the link so that you can get back to your sources. Occasionally, um, you may pull a quote or something and then realize that you needed something more for that source and you need to go back and be able to look at it. So there's another benefit to that for you. Um, Check your margins and your spacing. Uh, fonts also. The, um, the goal is not to have the longest bibliography. And I've seen kids who've done some really creative stuff. I've seen some bibliographies done in font, and they're a little bit more than double spaced, and maybe the margins are squeezed. It just looks more obvious that you're, that you're trying to stretch the bibliography. And so use the consistent spacing. It's usually a one inch recommended. It's usually double spaced for MLA, um, size 12 font, something that the judges can read. I don't necessarily suggest an 11 font because, or size 11, because in some fonts it can be difficult to read. So I always have my kids go with a size 12. And again, proofread, 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 so that you make sure that you have very basic errors and spelling errors that are going to get caught um, by judges cleared up before it gets to that point. Um, you can have two very equivalent projects going head to head and the judges, the tiebreaker may end up being how, how good the research is, so that what the bibliography shows, and how effectively um, they've put it together. And so this is really important. Um, also, this is a very professional project. You guys have invested hours and hours into this. It should be as polished as possible. This is kind of the pinnacle of your presentation. Um, I suggest that kids number the pages in the bibliography. Sometimes they come off the printer backwards. This is going to help you keep them in order. And I would recommend that it not be double-sided, because judges need to be able to flip through the bibliographies quickly. And that's a little bit harder to do when they're double-sided. Um, Staple them, don't clip them, guys. If they're clipped together, they can, they can fall apart and fall on the ground, and um, that can be hard for judges to manage. And then um, annotation creep. This is kind of a big one at nationals. Your annotations should be very direct. They should be two to three sentences tops for everything, unless it's a very detailed interview collection or something that has a longer explanation. Aside from that, they should be very concise. This isn't about dragging out the length of the bibliography. It's about explaining very quickly what the source is means. So bigger's not better. Um, it's always fluff. And about those wikis. Wikis are inherently unequal, and we've gone over this because people can edit them. Um, wikis are a great starting place. But in general, um, you don't want a bunch of wikis in your bibliography. It doesn't show depth of research. And remember, this is legitimizing and justifying your project. So you want it to be um, fairly in-depth. And that's um, I think that's it, right, Lynn? Is that my last slide? That's it. Thank you so much, Amy. That's it. Thank you so much.
what I'm going to ask is to have all our presenters mute themselves. I'll call you out for a couple questions here. If you have questions, please go to the question box or tweet those in. We'll stay a few minutes and answer those. If you do need to go, please take a moment, give us a little bit of feedback. Uh, if you are a student or a teacher looking for a digital badge to show that you were here and stayed till the end, just go to tinyurl.com slash nhdwebinars and I'll go ahead and send them. Uh, let me ask a couple questions. Uh, first one, I'm going to actually toss to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, if you have students who are looking at older topics, let's say the Middle Ages or ancient history, um, that's not something NARA has a whole lot of, but what kinds of places would you suggest students with these type of topics go to look for primary sources? Um, someone had talked about uh, investigating WorldCat, which is a great resource. But what I really suggest that the students do is to go to their school librarian or to the reference desk of their local library and sit down with one of their librarians to investigate the different resources available to them for those early time periods. A lot of medieval records that are going to be primary sources are going to originate with the church, um, and some of them are copied several times over. But a lot of those holdings are in universities across Europe, and some of them are still even at the Vatican. Okay, thank you so much. Here's a question. Actually, Stacy, I'm going to toss this question to you. One of our students is asking, what if you're looking for more modern history, maybe looking at history of technology um, or software, things like that, Where, what kinds of sources might you use or what kind of places might you go to find some information on more modern topics? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Um, I think that I would echo actually exactly what was just said, which is going to a librarian at your local school. You know, reference librarians are really great at being able to figure out where these papers are. And depending on your topic, it could be one archive, depending, you know, if you're interested in a certain type of technology um, versus another, you know, like space technology would have specific, maybe the NASA records at the National Archives. You know, they can go all the way up into uh, recent decades. Um, but other topics, you know, maybe you'd want to go to the MIT archives. So, um, you know, academic institutions versus government institutions, it's really helpful to get to narrow down your topic as much as possible before you start looking for those kinds of sources. And then once you have a, a better idea of the specifics of your topic, asking a librarian about a few of the really well-known repositories um, would be a, a good idea. Excellent. I have another question I'm going to take here. Uh, question about certain leaders. Where would you find sources on Thomas Edison, or where would you find sources on some other leaders? A couple things that I'm going to suggest. Uh, for my person looking for Thomas Edison, I'm going to suggest that you go to 100leaders, 100leaders.org. Thomas Jefferson is, or excuse me, no, Thomas Edison is one of our profiles there. Thomas Jefferson's there too. But what we have is, is a new resource to get students started. And if you scroll down in the gallery of leaders and find your leader and scroll down to the bottom of their profile page, there's some great resources to get you started. One thing I'm going to encourage all of the students to do for any of the leaders they might be studying is to ask the question, who has this person's papers? The papers are the effects of that person. They might be letters. They might be documents. They might be bills or records. And those are the kinds of places that I would say, look and see who has the papers of that person. You might be surprised. It might be somewhere that's in your backyard. And if not, I would look these up because every day, libraries and archives are working hard to digitize and put more and more sources online. And often that's a great starting point to see what they have online. And then I always encourage students to email or call and ask and see what kinds of things um, they might be able to find or how the archivist might be able to help them. Okay, uh, actually here's a question. Courtney, I'm going to ask you. Uh, if so, students are looking for resources on the First Ladies of the United States, where are some things that you might be able to point them towards to get them started? Well, our website is a great, a great starting point. Um, our website is whitehousehistory.org. And we do have a lot of great resources on First Ladies. We actually just partnered with C-SPAN to do a year-long series on each First Lady. So that, that also has a lot of great resources as a result of that collaboration. Um, in Ohio, there is a First Ladies Library. 
um, and they have a lot of really great resources as well. Um, it's at firstladies.org. Excellent. Okay, well, we're going to take a minute. Actually, going to pass one question to Amy. One of the things that students have been asking is, how do you know if a bibliography is accurate? Can you talk about some of the things that the judges would be looking for when they're evaluating a student's bibliography? Sure. Um, so, it, it, again, it's going to depend on the topic. If it's a, uh, if it's a World War II topic and, and you're citing textbook after textbook, that's, that's probably not the best way to approach a bibliography. Um, judges want a variety of sources. And so they're looking to see, did you do any academic interviews? Those are really important. I think that interviews are critical because they sort of bring history to life. And they provide you, especially if you're talking to experts, because they provide you with the opportunity to get feedback. Do you have a, a number of different primary sources? So am I only looking at um, one person's diary? Or did I also access newspaper articles from the time? Did I find um, maybe this, this another side of the story? Am I looking at the story from just one side? Or am I telling both sides of the story? Um, if it's a, a you know a, a topic that has um, a span of history, a lot of times our topics, especially this year's, when you look at this year's topic, there's going to be an event. But when you look at the why it matters, we're talking sometimes about decades and and or centuries. And so we might need to look at other historical context. If I'm doing a story on the Children's March. Did I look at the historical context of what led into this? Am I looking at what's going on elsewhere in the country? Um, and so they want a variety of sources. They don't want the same thing listed over and over again. They want some primary, some secondary, and a mixture. Pictures, newspapers, books, um, interviews, whatever you guys can get your hands on, the more the better. Does that, does that answer that? Absolutely. Uh, one other student question that we're starting to hear is the question of what happens when you have sources that conflict with each other? And I'm going to tell that student the best thing to do is to go to those reference sources. Go to the books, see what's been vetted. Remember that books have been edited. They go through a multi-step process where everyone has checked what's in there. And I always think that when in dispute, I always go to the books because I think that usually gives you the best sense of the information. What I'm going to do is leave you with one other information. If you're interested, go to NHD.org and check on the blog, The Voice of NHD. One of the things that we are started, we just launched today, is a social media contest for students to promote their favorite leader, their 100 leader. That's something we're using, that we're setting up, hopefully to get some students involved and engaged. And you never know, um, some students who participated in our last social media contest won some great prizes, so you never know what will come out. At this point, I'm going to ask a thank you very, very much to our guests from the White House Historical Association and the National Archives. We really do appreciate your time and your energy. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. I'm going to pause the recording. We'll leave this up here for just a moment. So please go ahead and fill out your survey on the way out. Have a wonderful evening, and thanks for sharing your time with National History Day, the National Archives, and the White House Historical Association. Good night.